We're actually going to have a two-part series here. Uh, tonight uh, is the first part, verses 2 and 3. Uh, let me read that. And Yes, sir. We do have fellowship tonight. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody remembered that except for Leon and Lynn and I, but uh, hopefully some others did too. What's that? It is, but we're not meeting next week, and last week we discussed it. We could have missed it and done it next month, you know, twice or something like that, but everybody said, okay, let's do it next week, so bring food. But if you didn't bring food, don't worry about it. We're still going to have fellowship. I think my wife has five meatballs back there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 2 and 3. Consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let's pray. Father, as we come this evening, we do once again thank you for your wonderful love and care for us. We thank you that we do have someone who is guiding and leading us through all of the steps of life. Uh, sometimes we don't see that guidance. Sometimes we're not even looking. Uh, but you being sovereign... Uh, bring us uh, step by step and ultimately lead us to the place uh, where we find ourselves today and uh, where we will find ourselves tomorrow. We thank you for that assurance. And as we consider the things that we're going through, uh, that we might learn uh, both from tonight's uh, scripture as well as through experience uh, how to trust you and uh, know that you are bringing about good for us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, in our day with the softening of the gospel, easy believism, I don't know if I spelt that right, but uh, my computer did not like that as a word, uh, the lack of true discipleship, um, what I mean by that is, well, I downloaded several articles on discipleship here recently, and the first point of the first article was, uh, making disciples is not the same as being a disciple. The uh, whole point being is a lot of people don't mind coming to church and learning, but making a disciple is actually where you're teaching someone else. Uh, that seems to lack in some cases within the church. Uh, it goes on to say, It is understandable that within every true Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, one might find many who do not have true salvation. Many have great assurance of their salvation until... It is tested by hardships and disappointments. The way people handle trouble reveals the level of faith in which they are walking. Is their faith living and genuine or dead and imitation? Now, please understand that within that statement, it allows for a spectrum. You're not either, you don't either have living faith or dead faith. You may have weak living faith, growing living faith. Uh, abundant living faith. See what I'm saying? So uh, don't feel as though it's an either or. Uh, there's a spectrum there. Uh, anyone who lives in this world will suffer a measure of trouble, a consequence of the fall. Job's friend Eliphaz said, yet man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. Job 5, 7. Job said, man who is born of a woman uh, is of few days and full of trouble. Job 14, 1. David cried, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none, uh, none to help. So I'm Isaiah says, Then they will look to uh, the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom and anguish. Uh, it almost sounds like a hee-haw song. Gloom and anguish, and, and they will be driven into darkness, Isaiah 8.22. Solomon writes, For all his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome, even in the night, his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. Ecclesiastes 2.23. God's saints are not beyond trouble, even in the most intimate relationship. But even if you do marry, Paul says, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh. But I would spare you, 1 Corinthians 7.28. Imagine that. Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. 
James writes this letter of exhortation to encourage the recipients to live what their lips espouse, to prove their faith is genuine. If faith is genuine, it will prove itself in the midst of trouble. If faith is a mere profession or based on sentiment and not on intelligent conviction of divine truth, it will burn up in the midst of fiery trials. So, number two, from trials to triumph, part one. First of all, let's start with eight purposes for trials. Uh, number one, one of the purposes of trials is to test the strength of our faith. Okay? Tests are meant to make us take spiritual inventory. Uh, one of the things that, I don't know about you, but in school, uh, when you were taking tests or things like that, for the most part, kids, they want to know that they have a passing grade. Okay? They're not worried about what they missed. They're only making sure that I've got a, you know, 88, 90, 93, or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, if I don't have a passing grade, then, oh, no, I'm in trouble. What they ought to be doing is when they realize they've missed some, they ought to be going back and reviewing what they got wrong. So the next time they take the test, they can do better. Makes sense, right? But of course, as young people, we didn't think like that, so why would we think any would think that way today? But tests are meant to make us take spiritual inventory. Letter B, our reaction demonstrates the condition of our faith. Uh, we have Travis and Rachel living with us at this time, and whenever two families are living together, uh, it's different than two sinners living together. Now you get a bunch of sinners living together, and you, you get to see and evaluate other people's uh, faith and how it reacts under certain circumstances. And I'm sitting there going, wow, Rachel didn't see any one of us act like that when she was growing up, did she? Uh, yeah, uh, she did. Uh, and, you know, some of Travis's responses are because he watched a couple of sinners growing up also. Uh, so our reactions demonstrate the condition of our faith. If we respond in resentment, bitterness, self-pity, our faith is weak. Or one might say you don't have any. Okay, but that's another passage. We'll get there later. If we respond by turning more and more to the Lord for help in carrying the burden, our faith is or will be getting stronger. God told Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. Exodus 16.4. A lot of what God did while they were wandering through the wilderness was just to prove to them that they really didn't have what they thought they did. Uh, when uh, Moses is talking to God, God's got a bunch of rules. Uh, the people sit there and say, hey, you just tell him whatever he wants, we'll do. And God sat there and said, oh, if they only had the heart. Because he knew they didn't, but they obviously didn't uh, know. Number two, another purpose for tests is to humble us, to remind us to trust in the Lord. I don't know about you, but when you're walking uh, you know, in your day-to-day, -day, when you blow it, Usually, what comes right before you're blowing it? Pride goes before a fall. So one of the purposes of tests is to humble us, to remind us to trust in the Lord. Letter B, to keep us from presumption and spiritual self-satisfaction. We may conclude that blessings come because of our own accomplishments rather than from the Lord. You know, I look at my kids and... Uh, a few of them are making more money than I've ever made in my entire life, I think, all together. Uh, and I sit there and remind them, you need to remember, God has blessed you. Don't ever feel as though just because he's given you the personality that you have, the abilities that you have, that you can live without him because those blessings will dry up like there's no tomorrow if you're not careful. Uh, so... Uh, we may conclude that blessings come because of our own accomplishments rather than from the Lord. Number two, and uh, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan 
to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul is speaking of himself. Uh, he starts out with, I know a man that went into heaven. Don't know if it was in the flesh or in, in the spirit or whatever. Uh, but he's there and he hears these great revelations and he sees things that no man has ever seen. And then he starts talking about this thorn in the flesh that was given to him so that he wouldn't get too proud. And uh, that's what he's talking about here. Number three, a third purpose of uh, tests is to wean us from our dependence on worldly things. One of these kinds of tests is uh, the things that happen as you're getting older. Is anybody getting older here? Do you feel it from time to time? Um, <laughs> I, I did a, a perusal over the whole crowd there, Leon. You didn't have to feel guilty. <laughs> um, the, the, you know, I, I like going to the gym and I've got this uh, tendonitis in this elbow right now. And uh, so my daughter says, don't do anything for a little while. So I don't go to the gym for about a month. You know what that does to you? <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, my bones are creaking when I'm walking up the stairs and stuff like that. And I finally go back to the gym. And of course, the elbow hasn't changed. And yesterday, I got, I got this brace that you know kind of puts a little dent right there in my arm and uh, pushes pressure on that tendon. Makes it feel better while I'm wearing a brace. Well, yesterday I was wearing the brace and it hurt all day long. Today I was wearing the bra brace and it hurt all day down. Oh, I finally took it off. My elbow feels great. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, it's one of those things that comes because I'm getting older. Now, I don't think that I'm getting that much older, but the body is starting to feel a little bit of age. So, to wean us from our dependence on worldly things. You know, as long as everything's going great uh, with your health and things like that, uh, it's very easy to think that, you know, I can handle it until things start falling apart and then you start realizing you need God that much more. Letter A, the more we accumulate possessions, knowledge, experience, and recognition, the more we are tempted to trust in things, reason, uh, or self instead of the Lord. Philip in John chapter uh, 6, uh, Jesus says to him, Philip, I want you to feed the people. And Philip's looking at all the people and says, we've got a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish. We, and, you know, 200 denarii wouldn't feed these people. There's too many of them. Philip passed. I mean, he flunked the test. Okay? He failed it. He looked at his, uh, what he had, and with reason came to the conclusion, this cannot be done. Uh, one of the things I love in that verse is it says, Jesus knew what he was going to do. <laughs> you know, every test we go through, God knows what he's going to do. He's giving us an opportunity to trust in him. And so often we depend upon our reason or something like that. So Philip and the test of the feeding of the people, John chapter 6, 5 through 7, he gave reasons why they couldn't feed the people. Moses, after 40 years on the backside of the desert, God comes to him and says, hey, I want you to go to Egypt and uh, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And he goes, I, 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 can't, I can't talk. He gives a half a dozen reasons as to why he can't do what God said. Well, one of them is, I already tried that, it didn't work, so uh, we're not going there again. And it's kind of like God saying, yo, I'm calling you to do this, I'm going to enable you to do this, now you're going to do this. And he just keeps on giving more reasons why he can't, Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 25. A fourth reason for tests is to call us to our eternal and heavenly hope. The longer and harder that trials are, the more we look forward to being with the Lord. Romans 8.18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Or 2 Corinthians 4.17, For our light affliction, tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, whatever it is, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. A fifth reason for tests is to reveal what we really love. And of course, Abraham's going to be talked about in chapter 2, but Abraham's offering of Isaac, it not only proved his faith was real, it also proved his love for the Lord. Or in Luke 14, 6, 
Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this is not saying that I have to hate Lynn. This is saying that God has to come first in my life. In comparison to my love for Lynn, my love for him has got to make that love look like hate. Okay? So I'm more concerned with what God wants than what my wife wants. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And the Scripture also says in Romans chapter 8 that if you love your neighbor, as well as James chapter 1, I think it is, if you love your neighbor, you have fulfilled the whole law, which means you fulfilled the first law, which means you love God too. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, moving right along. Uh, the fifth purpose of test is to re reveal what we really love. This is like the other side of number four. No, I, this is the one that I was just doing, wasn't it? Let's go on to the sixth reason for tests. To teach us the value of God's blessings. We evaluate value based on reason and our senses, at least initially. And when we consider what we hold uh, valuable, it's usually what our surrounding environment tells us is valuable. Uh, I have a 33-year-old uh, truck. Um, it's got a lot of rust on it. Uh, there's a lot of new trucks out there. And cheap ones cost somewhere around $40,000. Um, I like my 33-year-old truck with a lot of rust on it. Uh, I, it's not what the world is telling me is important. I'm blessed to have a truck. Okay? Uh, so... But normally, we evaluate based on reason and our senses. Letter B, trials teach us to value the spiritual things of God, His salvation, His Word, His care, His provision, His strength, etc. I think of Lynn and I as we were married some 34 and a half years ago. The first several years... We needed to learn how to reevaluate the value of things. Uh, we valued an awful lot of things based upon her family background, my family background. Um, there was one point where uh, Lynn was telling someone in the church that we ministered at that she wouldn't mind if life ended because we were always fighting. They talked to me about our relationship. It's kind of like, hey, we have a good relationship. Uh, you want to know why? Because in my uh, background, whoever yelled the loudest won. Guess who won the loud or ran, uh, yelled the loudest? So there wasn't hardly any fights. I won them all. Uh, big difference in how we evaluated things. And so um, the more we walked together, the more we started to understand that you know, God is the one that put both of us together. It is the salvation that we both uh, are participating in. What does God's Word say about how we live this thing out? All of a sudden, that became valuable. And that's when, of course, a lot of those fights went by the wayside. Number seven, the seventh uh, reason for tests is to develop the saint's ending strength. Excuse me, that should be enduring strength for greater usefulness. Letter A, while all things are quiet and comfortable, we live by sense rather than faith. A uh, Puritan by the name of Thomas Manton said that. Paul says, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And the eighth reason is to enable us to better help others. Peter uh, is uh, one example of this. The Lord says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Imagine that. Now, first of all, did Peter fail? Our perspective is yes. Satan wanted to tempt him so that he would fail. And Jesus says, and when you return. So his failure was a temporary situation. God knew what was coming out on the other end. And the things that you learned in that difficulty, 
I want you to use to strengthen your brethren. Uh, how about Jesus? For in that he himself was, has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18. Uh, you know, he was tempted in all points just like we are. Oh, wait a minute. He never had to deal with internet pornography or anything like that. Right? Tempted in all points. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And in each case, because of his dependence upon his Father and his knowledge of God's Word, he passed the test. And therefore, when you're struggling with whatever temptation, you can go to him because he knows how it feels. And of course, the only way you're going to have any victory over that temptation is if you go to him. Okay? Uh, Paul, he says in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and uh, salvation. Whole idea is what I'm going through as God strengthens me, comforts me, grants me mercy, then I can do the same thing to you because, well, first of all, Solomon put it this way, there's nothing new under the sun. Every time we say there's something new, it's actually something old. It's just in a different wrapper. So anything you go through, I either have been or will go through, and uh, I can comfort you if I've been through it. You can comfort me if I haven't, and I go through it later. But someone's been through it, so they can comfort you also. Uh, so that is eight reasons why we go through tests. Uh, letter B, the means for perseverance. Number one, uh, notice that's verses 2 to 11. Tonight we're only covering verses 2 and 3. So the first thing that we need to have so that we can persevere is a joyful attitude. The word hegomai is where it says count or consider. It means to lead, command with official authority, to deem, to consider, to account, to be chief, count, esteem, governor, judge, etc., etc. This is an imperative, which means it's a command. And it is due to the natural human response to trouble. What's normally the first thing we do when we have trials, difficulties? What's that? Cry. That is one of the normal things that we do. What's another thing? Complain. Murmur. <laughs> uh, go into self-pity, things like that. And so we're commanded, instead of doing what's natural, to count it all joy. Uh, notice... Uh, James has the most imperatives per words than any other book in the New Testament. There are 59 commands in the little five chapters with 1,742 words. Uh, it is not just considerate joy, but considerate all joy. So you're going through the trial and you're supposed to, yes, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to Jesus. Huh? <laughs> Notice uh, letter B. Uh, the, this passage is interpreted by some on it pure joy, unmixed joy, complete joy, total or sheer joy. And from the context, all of those would fit. And this is not some sort of religious masochism. I think I spelt that right. Uh, but it is trust in the promises and the goodness of God. You know, it really is amazing. The more you get to know God, and when I, mean, when I say no, I'm not talking about no things about him. But you have experience, experiential knowledge because you've been walking with him. You see how he works. You go to his word and you, you understand things because it's kind of like, oh, that's what you mean by that. That kind of a thing. He reveals it to you. The more you walk with him, the more you start to understand God is the one that's going to bring this whole thing to pass. Faithful is he who called you who also will do it. And uh, I don't know about you, but at least with my church background, there was an awful lot of things that I had to do. 
And, and I'm all for saying we ought to be participating with this sanctification process as much as possible. Uh, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to cover some of that tonight. But the idea of being humble, being in His Word, uh, ask, uh, praying and asking for Him to reveal Himself to us, things like that. Reveal us to us. Uh, you know, Psalm 139 there, those last two verses. You know, Lord, search my heart, know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Why? Because there is, <laughs> and you know all about it. The first time I thought about you knew all about it, the first thing I want to do is run, run away from you. But then I started remembering how much you love me and the thoughts that you have of me. And at that point, man, I want to get on the same page with you. And so not only do I want to see the wicked get their due, I, I want you to go ahead and do what you got to do so you can change me. I want to be a part of that. So I'm all for participating. But let's understand, it is God that is going to do that work, okay? Uh, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Um, you can't change your heart. Your wife can't change your heart. Uh, your husband can't change your heart. Your, your parents can't change your heart, but God can. Your heart is in his, uh, the palm of his hand, and he turns it like a river wherever he wants it to go. So uh, we, we do want to understand his promises, his goodness, as we're going through tests, trials. Uh, because as we do that, we will start to learn the things that we need to learn. Number three, God graciously provides when his children willingly and uncomplainingly, I think that's a word, endure trials while trusting him. You know, it's not my favorite verse in the Bible, but no matter what I do, the more I walk with God, the more I see where Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is really the way that we're supposed to walk day in and day out, moment by moment. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path, even in tests. Letter C, no matter the depth of distress, God will always use trials to, for our benefits, and he will always use them for his glory. Now, you sit there and say, yeah, but I went through a trial and I failed. Mm-hmm. You failed. Why? Spiritual inventory time. Well, exactly. Okay. Somewhere in the rush, you're believing a lie. God's trying to show you that so that you can believe truth, so you can lean on Him a little bit more instead of on yourself, because that's ultimately why you failed. Okay. And ultimately, He's going to bring about the victory in that area. And just in case you're still of the old mindset that you have to get it all right, can I tell you? There are things that were in my life the day I got saved that it took 15 years for me finally to see the victory lived out in my life. Now, I look at that and say, a little slow of spiritual brain. That may be true. It might not be. Because the more I think about it, the things I struggle with today, same things I was struggling with when I first got saved. And now it's been 38 years. So I really am slow of brain, or as long as we're in this body, and the Bible does teach this, we're going to struggle with stuff. So it's not a matter of failure or success. It is a matter of walking with God in the midst of both of those. All right, letter D. We are not to act joyful in reluctant, reluctant pretense, but to be genuinely joyful. You know, I, well, I guess I'm supposed to rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I, I say rejoice. <sighs> no, no, that, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about leaning on His promises, His goodness, knowing what He's doing, looking to see whatever lesson it is, and take joy because God is at work in you. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, if He wasn't at work in you, that might be a reason to go, uh-oh, <laughs> okay? But if he's at work in you, that's a good sign that uh, you have genuine faith. Uh, moving right along. Uh, being joyful, counting it all joy, is not a matter of feelings. It is a conscious, determined commitment. It is empowered by God through the Holy Spirit as one humbly submits in thanksgiving. Imagine that. To be thankful for. Pick your test. 
those first how many ever years of marriage that we had so many fights. And, and yes, initially it was like every two weeks, and then it was, you know, once a month, and then it was once every three months, and then it was once every six months. But the reality is, is we, went, we did a lot of fighting because we just weren't open to the fact that it wasn't that we disagreed with the other person. We just wanted God to change the other person, and then we could think about us changing, Okay. And the reality was is when we both determined that we were going to do what God wanted us to do, regardless of what happened with the other person, that's when we both started changing. And boy, the fights really spread out. I mean, we just hardly ever have any. Now they're minor disagreements. Praise the Lord. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, So, But that's how it works. You're empowered by God through the Holy Spirit as you humbly submit in thanksgiving. Letter E. The more we submit to the lessons of the trials, the more we see trials as privileges that are ultimately beneficial. Uh, Doing marriage counseling or premarital counseling now, uh, I tell people about some of the stuff that we went through, and I'll take the blame for, you know, my share of it. I'll definitely put the blame for the rest of it on Lynn, you know, but uh, (laughs) the reality is, is I love telling people, you know, it doesn't matter what you're going through. God can get you through this thing. And your marriage can actually exemplify what a marriage is supposed to be before the world if you just do what he says. Um, Why can I do that? Because I have seen him do it in our lives, and therefore I know he can do it in anybody else's that is willing to uh, trust him through it. Letter F, Christ's example. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He, he wasn't looking forward to the cross saying, oh, goody. You know, he said, Lord, if, if there is any other way, if this cup can pass, please let it pass. But not my will, your will be done. Why would he go through all of that for the joy that was set before him? What's that? What's on the other side of the cross? Well, first of all, we got resurrection glorification. And then we have people getting saved. And those people, because the Spirit of God is in them, they are going to be changed. They're going to be transformed. They're going to glorify God on this uh, earth. And then someday they're all going to come up and be with me. And then we're going to come back, set up this kingdom, and they're going to reign with me. That's the joy that was set before him. God is going to be glorified because of this. So he uh, endured it. For uh, John 15, 20 says, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. (laughs) Let's start this new relationship with Christ. Oh, by the way, they didn't like him. They persecuted him. And you're expecting that uh, now that I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, everything's going to be great. Right? Not according to Christ. Hebrews 12, 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And when I first got into ministry on a full-time basis, uh, I know I've told you that I felt as though Satan had set a whole different set of demons after me at that point. But uh, it was discouraging. Uh, God was working to form and fashion me to be more of a pastor, uh, not just a a clown. Um, But... uh, the reality is, is I was offending a lot of people. It's not the message that was offending. It was the methodology of the preacher. And uh, it was discouraging. I don't know how many times I wanted to quit. I don't know how many times I've wanted to quit since then. But uh, the reality is, is uh, it is a discouraging thing. Well, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. Oh, what I went through, nothing compared to what he went through. Or Hebrews 12.4, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. Whether it be the difficulty with other people or just the difficulty of the law of sin in your members, not a one of us is bleeding trying to get it right where he actually did. I told you last week that James follows a lot of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Uh, well, he starts out in Matthew 5, 3 through 12 with what we call the Beatitudes. Blessed are, blessed is, blessed is, blessed is, a bunch of blesseds in there. Oh, the word blessed basically means, oh, how very happy. 
if you don't like happy, because that's a secular term, oh, how very joyful, okay, is the person that is persecuted for righteousness' sake. Huh? Yeah, because there's something on the other side of that thing, okay? But uh, here's how it ends. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Awful lot of count it all joy there in the first 12 verses. Um, now, when? It says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The word when there is hotan, whenever, implying hypothesis or more or less uncertainty, inasmuch as, as long as, uh, as soon as, uh, till, whensoever, while. Uh, this word is found in the subjunctive case. Uh, we don't really have a subjunctive uh, mood or case uh, in English. We use words to make it a possibility. If, uh, that kind of a thing. In other languages, it's right there in the verb form, uh, so you don't have a word for uh, if per se in that sentence, but it still means if. Uh, in this particular case, the subjunctive carries the idea not just of possibility, but inevitability. So when means it's going to happen. Count it all joy when it happens. It's going to happen. We just don't know when, okay? Uh, when you fall into, the word fall in there is peripipto, uh, to fall into something that is all around. That is light among or upon be surrounded with, to fall among. Um, it kind of reminds me of a trip we took to Mexico uh, when I was youth pastor here. And uh, we're driving a van out to the job where we're going to be building walls for a church or whatever. And uh, some of our youth were a little rambunctious. And uh, they decided, let's make the van into a mosh pit. Now, most of you are old enough, you're going mosh pit? What's a mosh pit? Well, at concerts, the people that are singing will throw themselves off on top of the crowd. They'll lay out there and people will just pass them along on their hands above their head. Well, they weren't going to do it above their head, but they did it like this. And so Ryan Rhodes, he, he kind of threw himself in there and everybody grabbed him and tossed him down to the end. And then the next guy, and this is while we're driving out to the job. Uh, that's the idea of falling into. Okay, there's something all around. Well, what was all around? All these people's hands that were going to pre uh, prevent them from hitting the floor, even though I'm sure that happened also. But that's the idea that it's, it's all around. So no matter what you do, you take a step to the left, you're going to be in a trial. You take a, take a step to the right, you're going to be in a trial. Uh, it's going to happen. And of course, that uh, brings us to the word for trials, which is uh, perasmus, uh, a putting to proof by experiment. Uh, by experience of, uh, solicitation, discipline, or provocation, by implication, adversity, and temptation. Uh, the idea is we're going to find out if something is real. Notice, uh, it, depending on the context, it could be positive or it could be negative. Uh, the verb form found in verse 13 is actually translated tempted, where here it's uh, normally translated trials, I believe in the King James uh, it's also uh, temptation, but it doesn't mean temptation like the temptation of Christ. It means a trial. And the purpose of the trial is to put the person to a test to find out if what they have in them is real or not. Uh, the word for various is uh, poikilos, uh, motley, that is various in character, diverse, or manifold, uh, which means it could be internal trials, it could be external trials. Uh, have you ever struggled with what someone might be thinking about you or what you think about a particular situation? You could go this way, you could go that way. That'd be the idea of an internal. An external might uh, be more my tendonitis in my elbow, but it could be, of course, a whole lot worse than that. Uh, number three, the way one responds to trials involves faith. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces endurance or patience. So the second thing we uh, have in order to uh, get through trials is an understanding mind. Verse 3, the word knowing here is gnosko, to know absolutely or, if you will, experientially. To allow, to be aware of, to feel, to have knowledge, to perceive, be resolved, 
uh, when you can speak about something because you have knowledge, uh, to be sure or to understand. Uh, so in this particular case, why can you count it all joy? Because you have experiential knowledge. You've been through these trials before. You see how God has worked them out. He's doing something that is for your benefit, for His glory. You're taking all these things into account, and you can rejoice because you know, as Romans chapter 5 says, that we rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation uh, pro- makes, uh, produces character or perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Okay? And hope that's not ashamed. Uh, and then, of course, in Matthew 13, 28, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know, you have experiential knowledge. Ah, summer's coming. Uh, or at our house uh, in the fall, you've got the uh, walnut uh, leaves. You know, they're on a stem about that long, and there's a bunch of leaves come off them. The leaves and those stems all fall off. And then you can go outside and roll your ankle on walnuts because they're all over the ground. Uh, Lynn picked them up one day with the grandkids and put them in some buckets, and we put them out on the street. I don't think they were there for 10 minutes. And someone stopped by and said, Hey, you throwing those walnuts out? Can I have them? It's kind of like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you know, we, we got more if you want. Um, but you know that when those things are happening, oh, fall's setting in. And we know that when fall's setting in, somewhere in rush, it's going to get a little bit cooler at night, a little bit darker a little bit earlier. And then, of course, we're going to take six inches off the bottom of the blanket and sew it on the top of the blanket and think that our blanket is longer. But uh, that's the daylight savings time issue, right? Um, so, but you know, you have this experiential knowledge because you have gone through it before. Knowing that the testing of your faith, the word testing is doki, dokimion, uh, a testing by implication, trustworthiness, trial, trying. It carries the idea of testing in order to prove or disprove its genuineness or validity. Now, Peter tells us, Uh, that we go through fiery trials, that the testing of your faith, the idea there is to prove that your faith is real. So as we're going through these trials, which, oh, by the way, later on we're going to find out God's the one that puts that trial there. And it's a good thing. We're not going to talk about that tonight, though. Uh, When you're going through trials, the purpose of that trial is to prove that your faith is real. Okay? Uh, Patience. It produces patience. The word for patience there is hupomone, uh, cheerful or hopeful endurance, constancy, enduring patience, patient continuance, waiting. Uh, Patiently enduring trials while trusting the Lord develops endurance. Uh, I told you with my elbow, I took about a month off of the gym and uh, finally got back a couple of weeks ago. And the first day I did legs. Uh, I don't know if you follow on Facebook at all or or Instagram, but you'll see these pictures that say chest day, and the parking lot is absolutely full. And then leg day, there's one car. Well, I, I feel pretty much the same way about leg day as anybody else. When you decide to do legs, especially when you haven't done them for a month, uh, you don't want to go back and do what you did a month ago. You want to start out with less weight, you know, like about four plates on each side, less weight. (laughs) And and you only want to do eight to 10. You don't got to do 30 because it's lighter or anything like that, because the next day you're not going to be able to walk. Now, the second week, this past week, I actually went in there and started with uh, one more plate than I did all of last week. And then I added two more plates and then added a little bit more because I had limbered up those legs and they were muscle memory. They were remembering what it felt like. And so I still didn't get up to where I was six weeks ago, but I went a little bit more because I'm developing the ability to stay under that pressure. When you're doing three sets of 10 with whatever the weight is uh, that I'm doing, uh, your legs are sitting there. If you're not ready, they start shaking. 
you know. Or if you're on your third or fourth set and your legs are just totally tired out, they start shaking. Thankfully, mine didn't start shaking until I stood up a little bit later on. And then it's kind of like mm, rubber legs. <laughs> See, developing endurance. Well, you got to go through the trials. You have to do the thing that you're doing to develop that endurance. And that's what going through the trials uh, does. It develops patience. And patience, no, notice patiently enduring trials, learning how to go through that trial, trusting God, remembering that He's good and He has a plan and a purpose for this thing, you start to develop endurance. Notice, endurance is the permanent inner quality of strength that is developed each time trials are patiently and trustingly endured. So there comes a point where the trial that once brought about all kinds of angst and, and complaining, all of a sudden, that's not as much of an issue anymore. But of course, God will bring a trial that's new <laughs> to develop patience and endurance in another facet of your life. Notice Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. Or one that a lot of people like to quote, and they kind of misunderstand it, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation, trial, difficulty has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Again, nothing new under the sun, right? But in the midst of that test, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able. Now, please understand, that doesn't mean you have the capacity within yourself to go through whatever comes into your life without Him. He is always intending that you're going to be trusting in Him in whatever that trial is. But think about it. What kind of trials did you go through when you were first saved? What kind of trials do you go through when you've been saved for 30 years? See, he doesn't allow you to be tested beyond what you're able at the time where you are in your walk, learning how to walk with him. But I guarantee you, you've been saved for 30, 40, 50 years. Some of the trials you go through are probably going to be a whole lot more difficult than when you've only been saved for a few years. Or if God allows you to go through some of those really difficult ones when you've only been saved for a couple of years, God is with you. And he may actually have something big planned for you because you're going to have to learn how to trust in him quicker. Okay? So God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tested beyond what you're able. With the temptation, he provides a way of escape. Now, again, how do we think about escape? We think about getting away from. In this particular case, notice the last verse, or the last part of the verse, that you may be able to bear it. That you may be able to endure through it. It's not a matter of getting out. It's a matter of getting through. God is there to do that. But again, count it all joy. Trusting Him, His goodness, His plan, knowing that He's got a purpose for this test. And part of the purpose is that He's going to produce patience, endurance, character, and hope that ultimately is not going to be ashamed. All right. Well, that is verses 2 and 3. And we still have a few minutes. Uh, we are going to talk about birthdays and anniversaries, but is there any questions before we do? Excellent. So, with that in mind, it is our fellowship night, and we are celebrating anniversaries and birthdays in the month of November. So, any birthdays in the month of November? Oh, we've got two of them side by side here. What do we got there, Larry? Twice, 29. You were 29 twice. Okay. Uh, what, what was that? <laughs> Larry's going to get himself in trouble. <laughs> 61 on the 14th, which is twice 30 and a half. <laughs> yes, sir. It was who's? Isaac's birthday on the 14th, and he is now 14. Oh, 14 on the 14th. Okay, yes, ma'am. 
Versi, who is not able to be here tonight because she's got a little bit of a cold, pray for her. It was her birthday on the 6th, and how old is she, 58, 59? She's not telling. Versi, if you're watching this at home, you have a good friend. <laughs> okay. All right, any other birthdays? Yes. Woohoo! 16 on the 16th. Sheila? Okay, 62 on the 22nd. Happy birthday. Any anniversaries in the month of. Oh boy, Larry's going for a threesome here. Yes, sir. 39 years on the 22nd. Happy anniversary. Okay, anybody else? All right, well, I know there. Yes, sir. In only 26 more years, you can catch up to Leon. <laughs> Just keep on going. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's go ahead and uh, give thanks. And uh, if, uh, if you didn't bring anything tonight, don't worry about it. They normally buy something. Come on back. Fellowship with us. Even if you're not hungry, you don't have to eat anything. Uh, there's always enough donuts, though. So let's give thanks.